Pan 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 Psychast. Part three, apropos of the wet snow. So in our last section, we read the first third. Of notes from underground.、Mm. In this week, we're going to read the second third, and in next week's instalment, we're going to read the third third. And who said two plus two don't <laughs> equal four? <laughs> <laughs> At the end of section one, we've got our protagonist, the unnamed underground man, saying, "Confessions good for the soul. It's good for us. One can at least try." And then he sees the snow falling out onto the streets of Saint Petersburg,、mm. and it reminds him of a time which once passed. And here we get the story of the apropos of the wet snow, which is twenty years prior to what we were reading about, which was the present moment in the last section, which was his confession. If you enjoyed our other story episodes, you're probably thinking, "Wait a minute! So far, this novel doesn't really seem to have any kind of narrative or any kind of story to dig into,、uh, and that's because the, the the novel is split into these、uh, different sections. And now is where we're gonna. Get our creative juices flowing a little bit, and talk about the actual narrative, which is a flashback, effectively, to twenty years previously, when the underground man was much younger, and he's going to go through some important events that formed who he was. And this is going to be quite a lot of fun. We've taken quite a lot of our usual pan sci cast artistic license with this. If you want to read the novel, it exists. You go and read it. It's quite easy to get hold of. This is our interpretation of the novel, and we're gonna. Obviously, we have to take bits. <laughs> <laughs> we have to take bits out of it, obviously, because、mm. we're just gonna read. If we're gonna, read, if, you know, we've had to edit so much out because of time. So we can't fully do it justice, but we'll do our best in analysing the key themes, characters. There's been a, a bit of reorganising as well, but you'll you'll follow it. You'll be fine. Well, it's going to be good fun. Us and the listeners are in gratitude to you, Ollie, for putting together the script for this part and the next instalment. And I think it's better than the original, if you don't mind me saying. So、sure、I don't think Dostin, you... Dostin, <laughs>、yeah. Dostin's just turning in his grave when you're just saying that. Ignore all of、Jack. part one when we said <laughs> how how much of a revolutionary writer he is. We've we've one upped him here. <laughs> <laughs> By saying we, Ollie has. Yeah, Ollie is. He, he really has gone. <laughs> Got him produced. Well, you'll see. Remind, yeah, well, remind me to well, put that、yeah. on my CV. Can't、yeah. quite find the words for what he's produced, but he's produced something. <laughs> <Yeah> . There <laughs> are going to be words that will be said, yeah, just like Dostoevsky did.、Yeah. <laughs> so, without further ado, here is our first reading of the apropos of the wet snow from the second section of Notes from the Underground. <laughs> <Sorry> . I <laughs> slurred on my words. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where I was going. Do with you、it. mind reading like scene one, tailor shop location, Mister Chirkin? Of course. Okay. Scene one, the tailor shop location, Mister Chirkin's tailors. Good morning, sir. How may I help you today? Good morning, Mister Chirkin. There are a few things of which I must purchase immediately. Of course, sir. Jerkins Tailors has everything a man needs. Come this way. What do you require? I require black gloves, a respectable hat, a smart shirt, and an overcoat with a raccoon collar. Right, you are, sir. We're just the tailors, but let me have a look here. What is the occasion, if you don't mind me asking, sir? Can you keep a secret, Mister Jerkins? As a tailor, I have been known to keep secrets, Mister. What's your name? I am planning to bash shoulders with a six-foot officer of the law. Is that what the kids are calling it these days? This six-foot officer pretends as if he doesn't see me, as if I don't exist. A few years ago, he assaulted me in a drunken tavern brawl. You, sir, you started a drunken tavern brawl? Well, no, actually, I wasn't drunk or brawling. I was passing by the tavern and peeked my nose inside. Without a word, he grabbed my shoulder and moved me along. That doesn't seem too bad, sir. He might not have even remembered you. Here is your shirt and coat. I have some leathern gloves if you prefer. No, black is fine, thank you. And he does remember me. I can tell the way he looks at me as if I'm nothing. How will you pay for this, sir? Sure, you can't tempt you with a beaver trim coat. It's damn good. Oh dear. Well, that comes to fifty rubles, please, sir. Wait, I've heard of you. You are a Poland flatmate. I was in the service for many years, and when last year a distant relation left me six thousand rubles in his will, I immediately retired from the service and settled down in my corner. My room is a wretched, horrid one in the outskirts of Saint Petersburg. 
Sounds charming. Take your clothes and please go. My servant is an old countrywoman, ill-natured from stupidity, and, moreover, there is always a nasty smell about her. Do you hear her? She is mocking me. No, there's no one else here. It's this rotten city. I am told that the Petersburg climate is bad for me, but I am remaining in Petersburg. I am not going away from Petersburg. I am not going away because... Please, go away from my shop. Good day, sir. Cool, wonderfully read, the pair of you. Know, I felt like I was in Mr. Cherkin's tailor shop. The first third, then, or the first section of the second part of the book is a really weird, obsessive storyline in which the underground man, walking past the bar, sees someone chucked out of the window. Mm. And he goes in there himself. I guess we can talk about why he does it. But he wants to get into a brawl himself. So he starts standing in front of the pool table when they're playing. And then one man, an officer, doesn't fight him like the underground man wants him to or chuck him out the window. He simply picks him up and moves him out of the way. Mm. It doesn't really matter. So the underground man obsesses over this. And we hear this in the first part where the underground man says, the person who's the overthinker with the higher consciousness they go away and think about all the stuff they wish they could do, but they can never just act and fight. And then he obsesses over this man over and over and over again. He starts following him, stalking him, finds out where he lives. He keeps walking up to him and trying to hit him in the street, but never plucks up the courage to do so. And then he goes and buys like nice gloves and a nice hat and stuff to go and walk into him. He wants to look like a gentleman to be seen. Mm. When he's there. And that's where the scenes came from. Yeah, this is a really odd start to this section of the novel because this is effectively the underground man's first humiliation first of many spoiler alert police officer in this situation in this tavern ball is literally just doing his job doesn't treat the underground man with any harm per se just simply moves him out of the way and then the underground man becomes absolutely obsessed with this humiliation that he was moved by another human being and that he is in no way remembered at mm. all by the officer. And that seems to wind him up even more. The fact that the officer doesn't recognize him, doesn't know who he is. And that it almost puts him in this, this we mentioned it in the, in the kind of previous parts, this kind of conscious inertia that he wants to, effectively he just wants to fight him. He wants yeah. to kind of assert his dominance over him, but he doesn't have the, he's paralyzed by the like, absurdity of the situation. And well, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I read this segment, it is, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> this guy perfect because it's this this guy doesn't even know this man is obsessive mm, about yeah. him uh, i love the fact that he goes uh and buys uh buys the new clothes mm. and that he he especially he wants to adapt his coat uh, to have a, a, a fancy collar mm. so that he will be respected amongst the public when mm. when this big showdown is going to happen if something bad happens at least he'll be viewed as somehow on the same level as this officer mm. blowing it all out of proportion no one would even care in the slightest and then my favorite bit about the whole thing is is that when when he eventually does build up the courage to brush shoulders with this man is that he's actually convinced it's like you know he pretended not to notice <laughs> but he yeah. did he did notice yeah, yeah, yeah. like <laughs> and then obviously the guy ends up leaving and then he and then he wonders to himself oh, i wonder who this guy is walking all over now mm. it's like probably no one well, he's, <laughs> he follows him doesn't he's like a, a just on the outskirts of st petersburg and he he sees that the officer walks away from people who are in better positions of power than him or better dress but then he doesn't walk out for the others and he hates this fact and, but we've got that unreliable narrator again in what you've just said like, obviously the officer still didn't know who he was from the reading but he even writes like a story, a novel about this yeah, officer, yeah, yeah. says he's horrible. And then he <laughs> sends it to a publisher. And apparently the publisher just aren't interested in publishing things like that. But no, your story was just crap. We know that from this guy's writing. So again, we know that the story wasn't good. And he makes mm. excuses. It must be somebody else's fault. He wants to be seen as uh, on the same level as this officer. And he wants to look good and feel like he matters. But in the start of the story, maybe throughout with no spoilers, he, he's constantly reminded of the fact that he doesn't matter. Yeah, and, and I've created this, this this situation, this tailor shop, which isn't actually in the in the novel itself because this actual scene is much more frenetic in the novel. It's just these, again, more ramblings of his journals and him talking to himself as opposed to actually interacting with other characters. And you can, you definitely get the impression when you read it, it's a very frenzied, obsessive, stalker-esque, creepy persona coming through from the underground man like he's not likable like everything we know about him so far is that he is just a, somewhat wretched and now we know very obsessive over the most minor minor humiliation mm. on his on his person which is 
a little bit spooky because obviously when you're reading the novel you're expecting like this big showdown to happen right like the six foot is going to happen there's going to be this big kind of like and it just doesn't and mm. it's just it's yeah like andy said it's quite funny because it's just so ridiculous the situation that he's built up inside his head that when nothing happens it's like oh well you know i wonder if he's thinking about me it's like he's not thinking about you at all he, <laughs> yeah. he's just doing his job probably. he doesn't know you he exist. doesn't know you exist and that's yeah and that, and you, there's lots of interesting stuff there you could i guess pick apart if you wanted to about like you know what kind of stalkers are like and mm. obs- people who do obsess over like celebrities or members of the public um and, and stalk them and follow them around and stuff but um, in terms of like the why he's doing it in the way that he is, I think me and Andrew came across this. I'm not sure if you spotted it, Ollie. It's a Nancy uh, Workman's paper on the comparison between Plato mm-hmm. and Dostoevsky, and some and notes from Underground rather. It's something just to keep in mind as we're going is that we're supposed to recognise a bit of ourselves in the Underground mm-hmm. Man and recognise that sometimes we're not seen to matter in situations where we'd like to be. Um, and or maybe we like somebody or or want to show somebody that we matter and they never pay any attention to us and we can think about that in our head uh, all the while unless we let it go and remember in plato plato isn't happy with us to have this kind of character in our literature in our in our poetry hmm. socrates tells us that we should never have an anti-hero as our protagonist because the people will always see a part of themselves in them and they'll think take for example that first section You'd finish that and think the Crystal Palace was laughable, like it's a stupid idea Mm. because of the type of rhetoric they've put forward, not because of the arguments, just because you kind of see yourself in the underground man. You can be spiteful sometimes. You do cry during toothache and it's that that sophistry in the background maybe. And that's just a point to think of going forward. We're supposed to see ourselves in him, but to what extent and does that carry any philosophical weight? So our next scene is going to jump to Simonov's apartment. Ollie, could you tell us what we can expect in the scene? Can you lay the foundation, the characters which we're going to hear from? Sure. So we're going to encounter quite a few characters that used to go to school with the underground man. So we've got Simonov, who seems to be his friend is a strong word. <laughs> the person who hates him the least, yeah, I, I think would be a better phrase. He's the most sympathetic <laughs> to him. Um, we've got, uh, I'm going to absolutely butcher this name, Trudol Yubov. Yes, who uh, uh, is really, really obsessed with his other friend Zerkov, um, as well as Fafitchkin as well. And these are people he used to go to school with and don't particularly think very highly of him. Mm. Scene two, the gang, location, Simonov's apartment. Cheers! What did you get up to yesterday? I walked straight into him, the six-foot officer. He pretended that he didn't see me, but I didn't give an inch. I didn't. Oh. The Russian romantic does not seem to let his romanticism get in the way of his career. He wouldn't lift a finger for his ideal, yet believes in this ideal steadfastly. You don't speak to me for years, and that's what you have to tell me? Rambling about romanticism? This is a party! You haven't changed a bit. Anyway, where were the lads? Oh yes, the impromptu surprise party plans for our amazing, wonderful, handsome, charming and dear old school friend Zirkov. Well, with seven ruples each, 21 ruples between the three of us, we ought to be able to pay to get some good grub. Zerkov, of course, won't pay. He's far too handsome and charming. Of course. Can you imagine Zerkov will let us pay alone? He'll accept all from delicacy. But he will order half a dozen bottles of champagne before the end of night. What a character he is. So handsome and charming. I can't think of anyone more charming than Zerkov. Not even Paul Rudd. I think you have a problem. What want half a dozen for us, four of us? So the three of us with Zerkov. For the four, 21 ruples at the Hotel de Paris at five o'clock tomorrow. How 21 ruples? If you count me in, it will be 21, but 28? Do you want to join two? Why Why not? I'm an old schoolfellow of his. And where will we to find you? You never were on good terms with Zerkov, but do you find him handsome and charming? <laughs> Seriously? We're not acknowledging this? It seems to me that no one has a right to form an opinion upon that. Perhaps that is just my reason for wishing it now, that I have not always been on good terms with him. I may have loathed him at school, but that matters not now. Oh, oh, there's no making you out. We'll put your name down tomorrow at five o'clock at the Hotel Paris. But it's a private thing, between us friends. It is not an official gathering. Right, me and Trivi need to go and meet our friend Maron van der Kolk at a bar for a game of the names you'd never guess are real. Yeah, see you some more at 5pm. Bagsy sitting next to Zerkov. Bye, Simonov. Cheer up, Gov. Okay, they have gone. Moran van der Kolk. That can't be real. Anyway, hmm, yes, tomorrow, 5 o'clock. See you then. (sighs) 
this is going to come out either really well. Or, <laughs> or, or really bad. Ooh, what a cast of characters. <laughs> and all of them have easy names to say, too. <laughs> uh, so what's going on in this scene? We find ourselves in Simonop's apartment. Yes. And the underground man's not invited. Yes, we see underground man being pushed aside uh, to, the, to the... So in the original version of this story, it's, it's very obvious that... Uh, underground man is just coincidentally in Simonov's apartment as this gathering's happening. He's not invited per se. And as they're kind of effectively talking without him, he goes, oh, can I come? And they're like, no, not really. And then Simonov's just kind of like, oh, okay, fine. If you really want to come, you can come. And these are people that he obviously went to school with, people that clearly know him well, and they're just not interested. They mm. clearly see him as someone who not only actively disliked Zerkov, a character we haven't met yet, but we will, but also just... Seems to be really unreliable with money. Seems to say that, oh, no, I'll pay my way. And yeah. we find out later that he's really not good with money. He owes loads of people money, doesn't pay them back. We've all met certain people in certain friendship groups who have been like that. People that are, are in a group of friends but don't really click with that. But they don't mm. really have anywhere else to be. And this is totally the underground man in, in this uh, scene. He wants to go. Mm. But he doesn't really want to go. <laughs> he, he There's a moment where he... Like he's preparing himself and he's like, he, he kind of wants to talk himself out of it. And he's like, yeah. no, I need to go because if I don't go, then I, how am I supposed to like <laughs> show them that I am actually mm. more superior? And he talks himself into this mess mm. and, and commits to, commits to going, which is, which in itself is quite funny. Seems um, like the biggest thing in his whole life. He, yeah. And he's like, <laughs> we've all been there. Like we've got a big event and we're thinking, look at that four or five, but he's obsessing over yeah. every little detail. Yeah. And he, and he gets it into his head, much like with the, with the man like that we had in the previous scene where he's going to have this big showdown yeah. and, he's, and he's like oh the the thing that they want is that they of course they don't want me to go well i'll go so that mm. that's just so i can be there so they can't basically well either like talk about me or or that they feel like they've got a one up on me mm. none of that is going through their heads at all he's created this little conflict in his own mind mm. um and then also it's probably worth bringing up his his experience of school even if just briefly here is there's mm. quite a lot of little tidbits in, in the text he really isolated himself at school to the point where he he, he really had no real friends uh, he talks about like his version of love is basically like having power and control over mm. someone like yeah. he, he, like a really twisted sense of what it means to be a friend to, to yeah. somebody so he alienates himself he puts all of his effort into his school work and and is that's the one thing he can uh, have over everybody else that in fact he's reading at a level that the rest of them can't even uh, begin to uh, cope with or at least that is the impression he gives I don't know if that's strictly true, but, yeah. but of course, from, on his account, it is. And then he gives this horrible account of this one kid who who might very well be his only friend, and he just bullies him mm. and makes him cry. And he's just like, <laughs> yeah. we might see something similar again later on. I mean, we, things we know already about him. Spoilers is that he doesn't care much for people lower down in society. He's quite happy to walk through them, and he wants to be able to walk through those higher. He doesn't get even recognized or acknowledged really in Simonov's apartment, just like he doesn't really get recognized by the man walking past him. So he's stamping his feet, just like, world, look at me. I'm really important. Mm. I matter. And this inertia, this overthinking of absolutely everything makes him sick to the world to thinking like, literally no one cares about me. No one's thinking about me. Like, mm. And I'm the center of the world. So everybody look at me. But we read this, well, I read this, as people are just getting on with their lives. Like, mm. If you weren't overthinking everything, if you were just being like the acting man from part one, like the person that just smashes through the wall rather than the person that mm. thinks about the wall all day, then you'd be fine. And, and this is, there's this contradiction again where he, if you asked him, he would say, oh, I don't care about any of this stuff. I don't care if whether they like me or not. But all of his behavior is this almost like obsession with social standing, right? Wearing the proper clothes, being in the right places, having the right friends. Even if he's have a rubbish time, is disliked by everybody. He wants to be almost adored and seen to be kind of the Zerkov character that people think is really handsome and charming. But he's just not. And he just can't bring himself to be that. Handsome and charming. We're going to meet Zerkov in the next scene. Oh, what a guy. I'm sure the underground man's going to love him. <laughs> <laughs> scene three. The party. Location. Hotel de Paris. I had been certain the day before that I should be the first to arrive. But it was not a question of being the first to arrive. Not only were they not there, but I had difficulty in finding our room. You there, waiter. You look like you're living in bad faith. What time is this table booked for? Yeah, I think how you see in the Russian, uh, six o'clock. I must now go and give outstanding service and deny my true authentic self. Please wait by the bar if you are early. 
I waited for what seemed an eternity, embarrassed and blushing. Then I saw them arrive. There you are! Hey, I, was, so <laughs> I was surprised to hear hey, of your desire to join us. Whoa, you and I whoa. seem to have... To <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> right. There you are! Hey, I was surprised to hear of your desire to join hey, us. Hey, so cool, so you and I cool. seem to have seen nothing of one another. Rubble, 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 rubble. You fight shy of us. You shouldn't. We are not such terrible people as you think. Oh, well, anyway... I'm glad to renew our acquaintance. <laughs> oh, you're so funny, handsome Zerkov. Have you been waiting long, underground man? I arrived at five o'clock, as you told me yesterday. Simonov, didn't you tell him that we've changed the hour? No, uh, I didn't. I forgot. Let's get stuck into these hors d'oeuvres. So... Oh, okay. <laughs> Come on, you don't have to do that every time. <laughs> hey, don't worry. So you've been here in a whole hour? Oh, poor fellow. <laughs> <laughs> It isn't funny at all for Fitchkin. It wasn't my fault, but other people's. They neglected to let me know. It was... It was simply absurd. It's not only absurd, but something else as well. You're not hard enough upon it. It was simply rudeness. Unintentional, of course. And how could Simonov, hmm? It's a trick that had been played on me. I should. <laughs> but you should have ordered something for yourself, or simply asked for dinner without waiting for us. I might have done that without your permission. If I waited, it was... I did not know your address. Simonov, try the vegan pesto bagel. It's delightful. So, tell me, are you in a government office? And your salary? Why are you cross-examining me? It's not a handsome salary. A few hundred rubles a year. It isn't very handsome, unlike Zerkov. Seriously, you can't afford to dine at hipster cafes on that salary. To my thinking, it's very poor. And how thin you've grown. How you've changed. Oh, spare his blushes. My dear sir, allow me to tell you I am not blushing, do you hear? I'm dining here at this cafe at my own expense, not at other people's. Note that, Mr. Fafitchkin. What? Is everyone here dining at their own expense? You should seem to be... And do you enjoy your job? I say, what made you leave your original job? I imagine it would be better to talk of something more intelligent. You intend to show off your intelligence, I suppose? Don't disturb yourself. That would be quite out of place here. Why are you clacking away like that, my good sir? Have you gone out to your wits in your office? Enough, gentlemen. Enough. How stupid it is. It really is stupid. We have met here, a company of friends, for a farewell dinner to our comrade. You carry on an altercation. You invited yourself to join us. So disturb the general harmony. This isn't bloody Love Island. Enough, enough. Give over, gentlemen, it's out of place. Better let me tell you how I nearly got married the other day before yesterday. Oi, oi. The exuberant lady whom I had last led on to declaring her love, and how I had been helped by this affair by an intimate friend of mine, Prince Kolya, an officer in the Hussars. He has 3,000 serfs, you know. And yet this Kolya, who has 3,000 serfs, has not put in an appearance here tonight to see you off, you lying horse. Are you drunk already? Let's raise a toast. Your good health and good luck on the extremely handsome journey of Zerkov to old times, to our future. Hurrah! 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 Cheers! Why aren't you drinking? I want to make a speech separately, on my own account. Spiteful brute. I'm standing against my will. Silence, snap here's for a display of his wits. I hate ribaldry and ribald talkers. This is not an island of love. I love justice, truth, and honesty. I love thought, Monsieur Zerkov. I love true comradeship and equal footing. I love Paul Rudd. Socrates died for nothing. The third Harry Potter movie is the best one. Don't at me. However, why not? I will drink your health too, Mr. Zerkov. Seduce the Caucasian girls and shoot the enemies of the fatherland. I am very much obliged to you. Damn the fellow. Well, he wanted a punch in the face for that. Everyone knows the fourth Harry Potter movie is the best one. Not a word, gentlemen. Not a movement. I thank you all, but I can show him for myself how much value I attach to his words. Mr. Fafishkin, you will give me satisfaction tomorrow for your words just now. A jewel, you mean? Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, let us all be off now to Madame Svetlana's brothel. Of course, of course. Of course. Zerkov, I beg your pardon. Fafishkin, yours too, and everyone's. I have insulted you all. Aha, jewel is not your line, old man. No, it's not the jewel I am afraid of for Fitchkin. I am ready to fight you tomorrow, after we are reconciled. I insist upon it. 
In fact, I cannot refuse. He is comforting himself. He's simply writhing. But let us pass. Why are you barring our way? What do you want? I ask for your friendship, Zerkov. I insulted you, but... Insulted? You insulted me? Understand, sir, that you could never, under any circumstances, could possibly ever insult me. You tell him, handsome. Olympia is mine, friends. That's agreed. We, we won't dispute your right. We, we won't dispute your right. <laughs> <laughs> I stood as though spat upon. The party went noisily out of the room. Jodolyubov struck up some stupid song called Wonderwall. Simonov remained behind for a moment to tip the waiters. I suddenly went up to him. Thank you, sir. I will use this money on more waiter outfits, as I have no life. But I love waiting tables. Simonov, give me six rubles. Oh, take your damn money, if you have no sense of shame. Wait for me, lads! I'm going there. Either they shall go down on their knees to beg for my friendship, or I will give Zerkov a slap in the face. Oui, monsieur. If continental philosophy has taught me one thing, is that it is perfectly logical to stalk some old school friends to a brothel and assault them. What? Are you paying by cash or are you paying by check? Wonderfully read, gentlemen. Let's analyse a little bit of that scene then. What do we think of the main themes that the listeners should be aware of at the dinner party at the Hotel del Paris? So this is quite a long scene in the novel where the underground man goes to a party at the Hotel del Paris and he's already humiliated because he's an hour early mm. and they haven't told him that he uh, that the time moved. And if that's ever happened to you in real life, you can imagine how frustrating that is. So he waits around, he doesn't eat heavily implied that he drinks a lot in the meantime, but we'll talk about that maybe in a moment. The party arrives, we get Zerkov, who's this really bold, brash, braggadocious character, almost what the uh, the underground man wants to be or is in opposition to. They start off asking each other questions and it seems like they might get along, but then it just quickly turns into just, they start ridiculing him, he starts being defensive and rude, and the whole thing falls apart. We didn't really have time to add it in into our version, but in the actual novel itself, there's a section where the entire party moves to some sofas in like mm. this cafe, and the underground man's sort of left on his own, stew in his own thoughts, and gets himself more worked up to give this really drunken long speech that goes nowhere and doesn't really mean anything. And the the rest of the, the friendship group just see him as a bit of a joke mm-hmm. uh, and very embarrassed. And he's obsessed with lots of minor details about his clothes. There's a stain on his on his trousers, a yellow stain that he's obsessed with. And they think that that's the reason why they're being really horrible to him. Yeah. It's like, no, it's just because you're being really socially awkward and, and combative. Like challenging for Fitchkin to a duel, but then he doesn't really want to duel him. And it's, and it's just very connected to the initial scene with the six foot mm. officer, just on a bigger scale. Just more and more social humiliation, more and more getting across this idea that this character is just pungent to be around. He's, he's a, in the background and he wants to be at the forefront of from the officer to not them really engaging with him in Simonov's apartment to, like you say, a, a great example being that they didn't tell him that it was going to be an hour later at six o'clock rather than five o'clock. And we read this and I've heard analysis of the text of like, here's the underground man making it all up. But they don't tell him, to be fair. Like, it's not that they're not just thinking about him like they're actively not going out of their way to like make him feel like he's recognized at all so it's not just people are ignoring him like people that they know he's going yet they don't tell him so there's a conscious decision in him being pushed to the the side here yeah uh, well i i think you're absolutely right um but i i guess it's interesting when they're actually there it's still partly self-inflicted on himself mm. so of course they he should have known beforehand that he wasn't going to awkwardly have to hang around for an hour and that would that had already put him in a, in a sour mood and they kind of just joke at him as they come in sort of saying like oh well you should have you should have known better to have just help yourself and it's like well of course no one would actually do that if yeah. they were going to be meeting friends and stuff but then yeah he has all of those awkward moments when they're when they're beginning conversation and he even get, he gets so angry as Ollie said and uh, worries himself about the stain and there's that bit where he sort of says well maybe I'll just pick up this bottle and like hit someone with it and then yeah, he instantly backs head. down mm-hmm. <laughs> like um you get yeah, yeah so wound up and and I think we've we, as we've already said he has that moment where later on he just he it's two hours two hours he paces up mm. and down mm. and, as he keeps like glaring over at them <laughs> by then you, you got no hope of ever building uh, those bridges back mm. to that. Uh, what, I mean, we can't call it a friendship group, but whatever type of acquaintance he wanted, yeah. he 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 completely 
blew any chance of that ever yeah. materializing. And we, and we can link this maybe back to the philosophy a little bit. Like clearly these friends and this friendship group is the the ego rationalism, right? Like so these people make clear, decisive choices. I want this food. We're going to drink this. We're going to go to this brothel. We're going to do this. They're not plagued, it seems, by these kind of inertious thoughts or parody of situations they mm. just do they just be the, the probably more the so there's the man of action which is the person that just does and the man of thought which constantly overthinks things and can't get anything done mm. whereas the egotist necessarily doesn't have to be a man of action mm. um i think that's just a problem of him over philosophizing and having that high order consciousness bear in mind linking with the philosophy in the first part it definitely is the fact that he lies to us several times in the mm. first part we shouldn't trust him he's the unreliable narrator so maybe it is the case that these friends don't actually know where he lives like he's ashamed of where he lives it's not the kind of persona he wants to give forth to the rest of the world mm. so i think it's entirely believable from what we've seen so far that we shouldn't trust him trust that they know where he lives and therefore we're living in the mid 19th century we're in 1840 during this story how else are they going to get a message to him they can't so maybe it did change and they can't tell him and that's again his fault because he's the one that's forced himself underground and that's a it's another really interesting thing with any any literature that plays off uh, obviously a narrator but it makes it very clear that the amount of time passed here it's such a long period of time even if you were trying to remember what could be a, a reasonably positive event yeah you're bound to get certain details wrong mm -hmm. so if he's trying to remember an event that happened 20 years ago uh, and he is writing all of this down and he's obviously very spiteful towards them is that obviously we have to be skeptical about his version of events here yeah. mm -hmm. um Although he does claim, obviously, very uh, right from the get go, that he is at least going to try and be as brutally honest about about what happened during these events. But how are we to take his word yeah. at that? Mm. So at the end, he shamelessly asks Simonov for money. He already owes Simonov money for the meal. He owes mm -hmm. Simonov money before he goes to the meal, and he asks for Simonov for some money again. And he's like, "Yeah, have your money if you're that shameless." And he ends up getting in a coach and rushing to the brothel now our next scene is going to be the brothel but on the coach on the way there he's got this internal monologue which we're not going to read which is him thinking that this is the biggest event ever like slapping zirkov in the face because he's been embarrassed by zirkov is the thing that he should do like this is his moment and he has this huge dialogue in his head and then he stops the carriage and he realizes no I've, i'm not actually going to do this and he goes no it's fate i have to do this mm. i have to slap zirkov he's embarrassed me like this is my chance to be the thing that i want to be to be the man of action mm. he arrives at the brothel and i love his his he goes through all of the possibilities of what will happen when he tries to slap zirkov mm. <laughs> and, and like, even if he gets beaten up yeah and he's gonna be dragged <laughs> off him and all of this beaten, stuff yeah. and he, <laughs> but I'll be the hero. Darling. He even hits the coach driver at one stage, doesn't he? He slaps him, and this coach driver's like, "What's wrong with you?" And he's like, "Keep going." <laughs> yeah, he wants to humiliate him, uh, and I guess we'll see if he does. Scene four: Madame Svetlana's brothel. Location: the brothel. Can I help you, sir? Yes, madam. I'm on the tail of a group of around three gentlemen who frequent Madame Svetlana's, uh, your establishment. One was very handsome looking. He indeed was very handsome and charming. A face carved by the angels. They said that you would follow them. Please follow me. She led me down some stairs into the underground series of rooms that made up Madame Svetlana's establishment. <laughs> Madame Svetlana greeted me and led me into a small room furnished with red partitions and candlelight. What brought me here? Vengeance? Spite? I would have hit Zerkov. I would have done it. A pale creature entered the chamber. The candle that had been burning on the table was going out and gave a faint flicker from time to time. I had fallen asleep and felt semi-conscious. I awoke to see two wide open eyes scrutinizing me curiously. The look in those eyes was coldly detached, sullen, as it were utterly remote. It weighed upon me. What is your name? L Liza. What weather? The snow. It's disgusting. Have you always lived in Petersburg? No. Where do you come from? From Riga, the capital of Latvia. Are you a German? Latvian? No, I'm Russian. Sorry, my geography is terrible. Have you been here long? Where? In this house. A fortnight? The candle went out. I could no longer distinguish her face. Have you a father and mother? He... he uh, yes, I have. You are as indecisive as a virtue ethicist with a simple ethical problem. 
Where are your parents? They're in Riga. What are they? Nothing. No. Nothing? Why? What class are they? Trades people. Have you always lived with them? Yes. Forgive me for asking such silly questions. I know this isn't philosophy bites. How old are you? Twenty. And I, I love philosophy bites. Nobody loves philosophy bites. Why did you leave them? Well, for no reason. Do you interview every working girl you pay for, Mr... Man, I saw them carrying a coffin out yesterday, and they nearly dropped it. Did you say your name was Mr... Yes, in the haymarket. They were bringing it up out of a cellar. From a cellar? Spirits along spirits. Very good. Not from a cellar, but a basement. Oh, you know, down below, from a house of ill fame. It was filthy all round. Eggshells, mountain dew, litter, a stench. It was loathsome. No, it's horrid. The grave diggers must have sworn at getting drenched by the snow. And there must have been water in the grave. Why water in the grave? You can't dig a dry grave in Volkovo Cemetery. The place is waterlogged, more than the critique of pure reason. It's a regular marsh. So they bury them in water. I've seen it myself. You don't mind how you die? I may be a whore, but I understand cant and simple grave digging. But why should I die? Why? Some day you will die. You will die just the same as that dead woman. She was a girl, like you. Like me? She died of consumption. Why indeed? Now you are young, pretty, fresh. You fetch a high price. But after another year of this life, you will be very different. You will be more unappealing than Hegel in a bargain bin. In a year? Anyway, in a year you will be worth less. You will go from here to something lower. Another house. A year later to a third. Lower and lower. And in seven years, you will come to a basement in the haymarket. Oh, great. Another chivalrous hero comes in to save me. Do you know anything about sex work? I know the dangers when I took this job. If I die, well, then I die. But one is sorry. Sorry for whom? Sorry for life. Realize it while there is still time. There still is time. You are still young, good looking. You might love, be married, be happy. And you are full of shit. Not all married women are happy. Not all, of course. But anyway, it is much better than the life here. Infinitely better. I am not an example for you. I may degrade and defile myself, but I am not anyone's slave. I come and go, and that's an end of it. In the words of Taylor Swift, I shake it off, and I am a different man. But you are a slave from the start. Like a utilitarian is a slave to pleasure, or a Nietzschean is a slave to bad philosophy. <laughs> yes, a slave. There you see, that's a bondage for you, pun the pun. You will never buy your freedom. They will see to that. It's like selling your soul to the devil. Didn't you just pay me? Doesn't that and besides, devil? perhaps I too am just as unlucky. How do you know and wallow in the mud on purpose? <laughs> you really know how to charm a lady. <laughs> <laughs> you give your love to be outraged by every drunkard. But how much is your love worth now? You are sold, all of you, body and soul. And there is no need to strive for love when you can have everything without love. I know they say treat the mean and keep them clean, but you are being way too mean. Don't doubt it. That's how it is. You have sold your soul. And what is more, you owe money. So you don't say a word. You are a ghastly human being. Why do you torture me so? Forgive me. My dear, this is my address, Liza. Come to me. No, stay away from me. I take your address. But now I am going. Goodbye. Wait, wait a minute. What is your name? You said it was Mr... Making no explanation, as though I was a sort of higher being, must understand everything without explanations. She held out a piece of paper to me. Her whole face was positively beaming at that instant with naive, almost childish triumph. It was a letter to her from a medical student or someone of that sort. A very high-flown and flowery, but extremely respectful love letter. Please take the letter. This is a precious treasure, Liza, but I must go. Farewell. A wonderful reading yet again. I really enjoyed your adaptation here, Ollie. We found ourselves in the brothel with this key scene between Liza and the mm. underground man. He's essentially degrading her, making her feel bad about herself. She starts weeping. Sorry, I didn't do very well at the weeping. <laughs> but she breaks down in front of him. In some translations, it seems like they have sex. In some other translations, it doesn't seem like they do. I was quite surprised from mine. And then started re it didn't seem like they had sex. And then the papers, people were saying, oh, they have sex. And the underground man has like deep-rooted homosexual feelings. I was like, I did not read any of that. <laughs> into like, I was like, is this the same book? 
Uh, I think that we, yeah, I think that must have come from one of the same things we read, where uh, particularly with the the homosexual tendency thing, I was like, where has that come <laughs> from? Um, uh, maybe that maybe I'm just missing something entirely there, but I I don't get that impression. He he clearly wants Liza, but also uh, obviously has problems with with trying to come to terms with that. So. There's a couple of couple of things worth picking out here. The first thing worth mentioning with all of this segment here is actually linking back to the start of the the second part of the book. Mm. We mentioned uh, when we began this segment that it was called Apropos of the Wet Snow. And that is a, a poem, or at least part of a poem, from Nekrasov, who is the person who was responsible for passing on Poor Folk, which, uh, if you remember from episode one, was his first novel. Mm. And, and so you would imagine that there might might be some kind of loving connection to this but it's more likely that this is supposed to be a parody the poem itself is all about bringing a person presumably uh, a woman that could be interpreted as a prostitute uh, somebody in disrepute mm. and then through the eyes of somebody of of like an upper class member of society this person is redeemed and here we have Liza in this brothel and the underground man is potentially in his own eyes uh, seeing himself as being above and beyond her and in some way is the only person who can point out exactly what her flaws are and really if she just listened to him then maybe everything will turn out okay. Mm -hmm. So in that sense he is a parody of that particular trope in Russian literature yeah. at the time. So that's an interesting little bit there. And then I guess the other uh, important thing to note is is that Liza while starts off quite timid and you're right in the in the translations I think it is clear after reading it again that they definitely do have sex mm -hmm. and then it cuts to them lying together and they have that moment of awkward silence and eventually he has to cut the silence because he mm -hmm. can't cope with it anymore and then they begin this dialogue and Liza starts off as as this meek woman and as the conversation grows i think she begins to to back herself a little bit more uh, she gets a little bit more heated into the argument she takes more offense to what he's saying yep. mm. yes she does break down uh, and there is that element at the end where she has that letter mm. which i think is a very normal human response she's just had this guy she's never met suddenly telling her how worthless she is and how yeah. bad her life's going to be and she says no i have this letter from somebody who i believe does care for me yeah. and there there is real love here it isn't something that is just being paid for mm -hmm. uh my life is not as bad as you think it is mm, yeah. and and that's where that's where they part company as we'll explore at the end of the book is is that ultimately that is the first sign of her actually saying no she is she's she's better than this guy mm. and that's a is an interesting turn of events from the the beginning of that chapter to the end mm. yeah a really fascinating chapter i think it's the kind of core of this book because it goes on for quite a while we've reduced it down very much and we've really underplayed how horrible the underground man is to liza there are some passages in here which are very very nasty very yeah. mean and the underground man almost is very arrogant and braggadocious about how like he couldn't slap zirkov so he's going to take out all of his frustration yeah. and his anger on this poor woman who has to suffer not only sleeping with this guy but then also having to be berated with this moral superiority and all this judgment he's saying on it. Like, you know you're not going to get married you're not going to have kids there's a really creepy bit where he talks mm. about how uh, fathers like favor their daughters and care for their daughters and kiss their daughter's feet and all this sort of stuff and it's all really overblown and He's only doing it to emotionally manipulate her. Yeah. He's not doing it for any... He doesn't believe any of this stuff. It's all cynical and, and, and nonsense. But he's just mm. doing it to make her feel terrible about herself. To make her feel more humiliated mm. than him. It's quite creepy and, and gross and uncomfortable. Well, we only see him do this with the, the story when he hops back to his past in high school that Andy mentioned earlier that he was really nasty to one of his school friends who, who wanted, like, he was being nice to him. And here again, we have someone doing something, well, nice to him, but it's, it's paid for. And then he wants to see if he can crush her, and he does so. And then he, it's not clear whether he just like cowards out or whether he has a little glimmer of moral fiber in him, but he gives her his address for some reason or another, as we'll see in the, the next section. It's kind of like, oh, I've broken her down. Well, maybe I'll throw her a lifeline. Maybe he's seeing himself like a bit of a prophet here. He thinks that he's, he's saving 
uh, yeah. the prostitute. So, yeah, so he berates her for pages and pages, and she eventually breaks down crying. I mean, she doesn't have to be taking any of this abuse. And then it's after her crying is when he he kind of feels sorry for her slightly, and in a moment of, he, I think he later refers to it as like a moment of, hesitation he just gives her her address like yeah. oh, it's not that bad cheer up you know it was all it was all a joke <laughs> yeah. um i just wanted to see if i could like crush you yeah in, in and yeah way. it's it's quite i think when i first read this book i got a bit i guess kind of confused i think at this point because obviously you know that this guy's an anti-hero that his behavior isn't going to be absolute but he's morally despicable oh like, i wasn't he, surprised he starts off like i'm horrible and, look how horrible i'm gonna lie to you i'm that horrible and he and you feel for him and that's the clever thing about Dostoevsky. He makes you feel like the underground man a little bit or makes you think about your own experiences because it's from the first person. Mm. So you feel like you are pushed the edges of society yourself. So when he starts to try and get some power for himself, you think, oh, yeah, OK, he's got a bit of confidence now. He's saying something. And you're like, oh, no, I don't like that. This is going at all. Yeah. And you can see how you might romanticize this and, and feel like the underground man is somehow excusable for it. But just take one step back and you'll see what he's doing is is crazy and horrible and yeah. nasty in every single way and hypocritical. And and this is textbook just childish behavior where he's come off the back of a very horrible social experience yeah. for himself. He is feeling about as low as you can possibly feel. He doesn't get to in- exact his revenge, although, of course, that never would have happened anyway because the moment he got into the room with Zerkov, he surely would have cowered down <laughs> anyway. Yeah. And here is this person who he, who he sees as just slightly lower down on the social ladder. And rather than doing what I guess he perhaps hoped the others above him would have done which is not take pity but show him some respect as he takes that immediate uh, opportunity to to do exactly how he he's been treated he's he's a horrible person in this this moment he might be the most unlikable character in any novella or novel uh, that i've read one of the most unlikable things about the show is mystery philosopher oh no he's gr- the best part of the show oh too. no you do- i like mystery <laughs> philosopher are you sure? Yeah. Sure. Let's have a game. <laughs> I would prefer it if Zerkov was hosting. <laughs> <laughs> that man is charming. And very handsome. Oh, very handsome. The, the Mystery Philosopher. So this is your Mystery Philosopher, the penultimate one for this series. It is an existentialist. Feast your ears on this one. The bird and the lily only go one day, and a very short day. And yet are joyous because, as has been shown, they genuinely are today, are present to themselves in this today. And you, to whom the longest day is granted, draw near every time you fervently pray this prayer of joy. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Andrew, I heard you. Maybe the voice was louder than you then. Uh, I I said Kierkegaard. Oh, it is Kierkegaard. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that's uh, from his his reflections on the, uh, or at least one. There, it's interesting. It's a very small uh, passage in the Sermon on the Mount uh, mm. where Jesus mentions the the lilies uh, of the field and the birds of the air, and then Kierkegaard writes three different reflections on on that piece. It's a nice little piece of poetry. Well, I don't like lilies, birds, or air because I'm the underground man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun.
you guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)